As the demand for smaller electronic devices continues to grow, we saw a need to develop a new family of non-volatile serial memory devices that would fit inside a 3-pin SOT23 package. To accomplish this feat, we developed the new single I.O. Unio bus. Using this new serial interface and combining it with popular features for many of today's serial EEPROMs, we came up with our new single I.O. Unio EEPROM family. If your design requires non-volatile memory, but the MCU has a limited number of I.O. ports, then a Unio EEPROM is the answer. Maybe you just need to free up a pin on your external connector for another requirement, or you just want to move to a smaller connector. See how this new type of memory can help you overcome these design constraints. As you listen to this seminar, ask yourself, will an EEPROM with one I.O. port simplify my design? Or maybe you might ask, will a smaller connector with fewer pins make our system even smaller and lower cost? Sometimes you're not looking to simplify your design, but to make it better. Then you might ask, can I add features if I freed up another I.O. port? If it's software resources that you're concerned about, you might ask, are software drivers available? We will be answering these questions as you listen to this seminar. In our agenda for this seminar, we will first go over the common serial buses used in today's EEPROMs. Next, we will introduce the UNIO bus and compare it to a couple of other popular buses used today. Since Manchester encoding is used for communications, we will also provide a brief overview. After we go over the UNIO bus, we will discuss some of the UNIO EEPROM features along with a few applications. Then we will also show you how easy it is to evaluate this device. And at the end of the seminar, we will show you where you can find additional information on UNIO EEPROM. As a brief overview, we would like to go over a few of the main features that are sometimes used when deciding on a serial bus interface. In the first column, the standard serial bus types are listed, followed by the number of I.O. ports needed to communicate with a microcontroller. Next, the maximum bus operating speeds and the density ranges are shown in the next two columns. And finally, the last column shows the typical packages used along with the smallest packages available for microchips EEPROM devices. The first bus I would like to talk about is the SPI bus. It requires four I.O. ports for communication and is usually selected when speed and higher densities are required. The most common package used for EEPROMs is the 8-lead SOIC, but Microchip also offers lower density devices in the 6-lead SOT23. The microwire bus also uses four I.O. ports for communication and can be selected instead of the SPI bus when slower communication speeds and lower densities are required. Sometimes designers will tie the input and output of the microwire EEPROM together so they can connect to a single I.O. port on the microcontroller. This configuration is called a three-wire bus. Like the SPI bus, the most common package is the 8-lead SOIC, but the 6-lead SOT23 is also offered by microchip. Now let's take a look at the typical configuration of a microcontroller connected to a standard SPI serial EEPROM. As you can see, there are four required connections between the microcontroller and the memory. If you want software control over the hardware write protect, you can tie the write protect control line on the memory device to the microcontroller for a total of five control signals. You can also tie the write protect directly to power and ground to reduce the need for another I.O. port on the microcontroller but it usually depends on whether you need to write to the memory device during normal operation. In this webinar, I'm not planning to cover the details of each signal line, but I did want to show you how many signal lines are required by the MCU to control a simple SPI serial EEPROM. Now that you've seen a typical SPI configuration, Let's see what happens when multiple memory devices are placed in parallel on a simple SPI bus. At first, it looks like you only have to connect the additional devices to the existing bus signals, but you should also be concerned with the additional I.O. ports 
needed for the chip select signals. A separate chip select is needed for each device on the bus, so multiple devices will definitely impact MCU resources. Now let's look at the I2C bus, which uses two I.O. ports for communication. This bus operates at much slower speeds than the SPI or microwire bus, but it uses the fewest connections, so it is the most commonly used bus for serially EPROMs. The most popular package for this bus is also the 8-lead SOIC, but the 5-lead SOT23 is also available for microchip for lower densities up to 16 k bits. Here is another drawing showing a typical configuration used to connect the standard I2C EEPROM. As you can see, there are two required connections between the microcontroller and the memory. Like the SPI bus, you can also tie the right protect control signal on the memory device to the microcontroller for a total of three control signals. You can also tie the right protect directly to power or ground to eliminate the need for another I.O. port on the microcontroller. When multiple EE proms are needed, the I2C bus has the advantage over the SPI bus because it does not require any additional signal lines for operation. Now that we've reviewed the standard buses used for serial EE proms, I would like to start the discussion on Microchip's new UNIO bus. This new interface only requires a single I.O. port for communication and supports speeds that are slightly slower than the I2C bus. The first UNIO EE proms are available in a 3-lead SOT23 package at densities up to 16 k bits. Here's a block diagram showing a typical configuration for a UNIO EE prom. As you can see, there is only one required connection between the microcontroller and the UNIO memory device. Unlike the previous buses, this bus has a software write protect so a separate control line from the microcontroller is not required. Depending upon the operation of the microcontroller when it's not driving this bus, an optional pull-up or pull-down resistor is shown in this drawing. If the I.O. port on the MCU is left in a tri-state mode, we recommend that you follow standard engineering practices and add the resistor to keep the inputs to the memory device from floating. If you need to add multiple UNIO EE proms on a single bus, no additional signal lines are required since all UNIO devices are software addressable. The first UNIO devices will not be addressable, but future devices will have this capability. Now that we've reviewed the different buses, I want to spend some time discussing a few of the UNIO bus requirements. As you already learned, the UNIO bus uses a single I.O. port, but let's discuss what that means. First, only three pins are used, power, ground, and a single serial data I.O. port. For communications to be supported using a single line, a Manchester encoder communications protocol is used. In a UNIO bus interface, the master will establish the data rate by sending an 8-bit start header at the beginning of all communications, and it is a job of the UNIO slave device to sync up to this data rate. An example of an 8-bit start header is shown below. The slave will begin the synchronization step after it sees a low start header pulse, but will synchronize only after eight consecutive pulses of alternating zeros and ones have been recognized. We've been talking about Manchester Communications, so now I would like to provide an overview of this protocol. The main reason for selecting the Manchester Communication Protocol was to enable the use of a single signal line for both the clock and data. Since data transitions occur on every bit, the clock can easily be extracted from the data and the UNIO device can sync to the data rate established by the MCU. As an example, take a look at the diagram below where we are showing the bit period TE. This period will support the UNIO frequency range and is controlled by the master, and the transitions are only valid at the middle of the bit period. A logic high is generated by sending a rising edge in the middle of a bit period and a logic low is generated by sending a falling edge. 
any adjustments to the signal can be made at the edge of the bit period since the middle of the period is reserved for the actual Manchester data.